Welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are making plans on when we can worship together as a family. So please check our website regularly for any updates. Now, let's all worship God together. If you're visiting with us, please take the time to navigate to billingschurch.org or billingschurchofchrist.org and on our homepage you will find this section to fill out a visitor's card. We'd appreciate if you'd fill that in and let us know of uh, any prayer requests you have or any other way we might help. We hope you have a blessed day today and enjoy worshiping here with us today. When Jesus found himself on top of the temple with the evil one, he would have been looking down on a bustling city. We don't know if anybody saw them there. We don't know who took note of that, but that event was recorded for us. And we have some important things to learn. Jesus was taken up there to put God to the test. And when we find ourselves in difficult times, we too can put God to the test. Safety is a big deal to us, and living in unsafe conditions is a significant stress factor. Psalm 91 mentions that the angels of God are instructed by him, not only to protect Jesus, but also his people. Lord willing, we will find comfort in that. The problem is that we don't need the comfort of those verses necessarily when everything is going well. But when difficult times hit, that's when we need to reach for these kinds of comforting verses. Now Psalm 91 sets exactly that uh, scene. Peril, terror, plague, and then points us to call on God. And we want to do that today again as we find ourselves in uncertain times still and potentially still getting worse. Specifically, we do well to praise God at all times, especially in tough times, and to worship Him no matter what. Worshiping God, especially in difficult times, has a profound impact on us, on those around us, and also in the heavenly realms. So this morning we're going to look at Psalm 34 to secure our focus on God, our worshipful focus on God, no matter what we're encountering. We want to do that again intentionally today. He promises deliverance, provision, attention, redemption. And so join me as we read Psalm 34 to prepare our hearts and minds to worship God today again. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried to the Lord, and he heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for to those who fear him there is no want. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and loves length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the broken heart saves those who are crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. 
the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Almighty, all-knowing, all-conquering God, we deliberately call on you on this day to express that we know you are God and that you hear and that you care. We struggle when your response is not the same as our desire, but we declare that we know you are faithful and trustworthy and good. We desire to worship and praise you authentically, in truth, wholeheartedly. Please be patient with us when, for whatever reason, we hold back. Please receive our offer. Please receive our worship. Hear us. Rescue us. Set us on a secure footing. We praise you. We love you. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, morning, saints. Glad to have you this morning. Hope your week's been good. Man, God has blessed us with some awesome weather. So hopefully you've been able to get out and enjoy that. Let me ask you a question. How's it been the last couple months during our Sunday worship? A little weird, strange, singing's a little difficult, communion, prayer time. And some of that, as you know, it's because God made us to be together, especially during our corporate worship. But let me ask you another question. How's your worship the rest of this day into Saturday evening? If it's been a little difficult for you every Sunday, let me offer something for you. Look for every opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I mean, go out of your way to be His light. I know we're still practicing social distancing and keep it up, but there are still things that can be done. There can even be things that you can do even in your own home. Like, how are you treating your spouse through all this? How are you treating your kids? Or when you actually venture out for necessities, look for opportunities where you can even just bring a kind word to somebody to say thank you to the workers still working. Be patient to others or bring a calmness because you know the master who can calm all fears. Ask somebody if they need prayers. There are tons of things you can do to worship our Lord the rest of this day into Saturday evening by shining his light, being his hands, his feet at every opportunity this week. So try it out. See if it doesn't change what happens to you on the inside. See if it doesn't change what happens to you the next time we meet corporately. I'll leave you with this by A.W. Tozer. Keep a Christian from entering a church sanctuary and you have not in the least bit hindered their worship. We carry our sanctuary with us. We never leave it. God bless. Cannot wait to be back with you. Love you. And let's continue worship.
It was the 22nd of March, 2000, that uh, the governor of Virginia, Ralph Northern, urged, urged all the people in his state to cut out any non-essential gatherings of 10 people or more. Bishop Gerald Glenn, pastor of the New Deliverance Evangelistic Church, subsequently met with his congregation on at least one Sunday thereafter. And during one of those services, it's reported that he said, I firmly believe that God is larger than this dreaded virus. And on April 11th, 2020, Glenn died from complications due to the coronavirus. And, and I don't mean to do any disrespect to Glenn, but his experience can be a teaching moment for us. I, I want you to think about how you feel about what happened with Glenn and what Glenn said. He said, I firmly believe that God is larger than this virus. And as you think about that, how do you feel? Do you resonate with that statement? Do, do you embrace it? Or is it something you find yourself trying to distance yourself from? And I think we as Christians should all be able to affirm the statement that I believe that God is stronger than this dreaded virus. If we were a call and response church, there should be some that's rights, some amens, and some preacher brothers. But functionally, we might differ. And so where should we find ourselves in this divide between trusting and testing? So this morning, as a congregation, we're going to look at the temptation of Jesus, the third temptation in Luke, and we're going to explore the questions that we encounter about trusting God and about testing God. In Luke chapter 4, verse 9, the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. For each of the temptations, the setting matters. The first temptation where Jesus was tempted to turn a stone into bread, it happens in the desert because the setting of hunger was necessary. In the second temptation, Jesus is brought up to a very high mountain and shown all the kingdoms of the world because he was going to be tempted with their glory and their authority. And now in this third testing, Jesus is taken to Jerusalem, and not just to Jerusalem, but specifically to the temple. But why Jerusalem? We New Testament Christians will look at uh, that, that ancient faith we inherited from the Old Testament, and we will sometimes say something like, well, they believed that God lived in the temple. And that statement's only half accurate. It's only half true. They did believe that, and the reason they believe that is because the Old Testament scriptures testify to the fact that God did indeed dwell in the temple. After Solomon finished the temple, we're told, God saying, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built and put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. So God says, the temple is my dwelling place. The temple is my home. And so what the temple meant was not just the presence of God, but the presence of God also meant deliverance and protection. So nearness to the temple was a sign of protection. Psalm 61, 4, let me abide in your tent forever and find refuge under the shelter of your wing. We have stories like Jeremiah 7, where, where people are saying, hey, I'm not concerned about these prophetic messages because we have the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. See, to a Jew, one's location to the temple really mattered. M maybe a way we could think about this is if you were, if you remember back to when you were trying to learn to swim and your parents might have stood six feet off your mom or your dad and they said, jump and I'll catch you. And as a kid, you're not sure that they can catch you there. And so you ask them to come a little closer, you come a little closer until they're close enough that you're willing to jump. For the Jew, the temple was the presence of God. And so their nearness to the temple was also their nearness to God. So Jesus is taken to the one place that every Jew knows. God will protect you. You are in the shelter of God when you're in the nearness and the presence of the temple. And it is there in that setting that the devil speaks of divine protection. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to protect you. 
and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Now, now this may be strange for you to think about, but it seems apparent to me that the devil has at least a freshman level Bible class experience. I mean, he, he somehow has learned the scriptures. And, and, and let's imagine that in that Bible class, he wrote a term paper on Psalm 91. What kind of a grade do you think he would have gotten? Some people might say, well, I'm sure he would have gotten an F. And you ask why, and well, because he's the devil, I'm sure he just would have gotten an F for that. But I think he actually would have got a pretty decent grade, a good grade, because of his understanding of Psalm 91. Psalm 91, which the devil quotes, begins by saying, you who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And so Jesus is taken to the very depths of the spiritual bunker, the temple, and he is reminded that he is indeed in the shelter and in the shadow of the Most High. And not only does the devil know the setting of the psalm, he knows some of the main themes and some of the main ideas. As we think about the devil outlining the theme of this, Psalm 91 says that God is a refuge and a fortress in whom we can trust. What happens to those who take refuge in this God? Well, the psalmist lists some of these dangers. The, the snare of the fowler, the deadly pestilence, the terror of night, the arrows, arrows the destruction, the war. And, and, and so when you encounter these things, what do we expect? Well, we expect that no evil shall befall you. No scourge shall come near your tent. Psalm 91 is full of promises. God says, I will deliver. I will protect. I will answer. I will be with them. I will rescue them and honor them. And so the devil doesn't misrepresent any part of Psalm 91. In fact, I'm guessing if he preached a trial sermon at your service from the text of Psalm 91, you would say, let's hire him. This guy knows his scripture. In fact, we could say his, his point of Psalm 91 seems to be, it says what it says, and it means what it means. And I could even imagine at this point the devil giving Jesus a bumper sticker that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Jesus, you should jump, because scripture clearly indicates that God will protect the righteous one. And if God would do that for a righteous one, what would God be willing to do for his own beloved son? Jesus knows God said it. Jesus believes it. But for Jesus, that doesn't settle it. Because Jesus answered, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. What the devil is saying, Jesus, in your context, you should use Psalm 91 as your guiding text. And Jesus instead responds and says, no, Deuteronomy 6 should in fact be my guiding text. Now, I would love to spend a lot of time talking about the implications of this for biblical study and biblical interpretation, but, but we're not gonna take a lot of time. But, but I would simply say that sometimes we might, might need something more than a book, chapter, and verse, because the devil can give book, chapter, verse. What we need to do is we need to learn to discern what scriptures best build a bridge between where we are and the meanings and messages of those scriptures. How do we know if our context should be guided by text A or by text B? We need to develop a deep knowledge of God and a deep knowledge of the word of God. See, the irony is that you have to know God deeply and to do that, you have to know scripture deeply. And unless you know scripture deeply, you cannot know God deeply. And Jesus seems to know both well. And that's why he's able to discern that Psalm 91 should not be his primary guiding text. See, what Psalm 91 is calling for is an act of faith based on God's promise of protection. The, the psalmist is promising another, he's saying you, you will be, he's promising another protection. And, and, and the reason that promise it seems to be made is so that that person will actively pursue something that perhaps they're not pursuing, or perhaps they're shy about pursuing. See, in that text, God takes the initiative to encourage someone to move forward on the basis of faith. But what about Deuteronomy 6 that Jesus quotes? So what Deuteronomy 6 does is it points back to an incident in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. There, the Israelites had arrived at a place called Rephidim. 
but, but they didn't arrive there as a bank blank slate. They arrived with a whole list and resume of the ways that God has provided for his people. They have witnessed the plagues, the Red Sea, already the provision of water, and already the provision of bread in the desert. And so when they arrive at this place and there is no water, what God wants them to do is to trust, trust him that he will provide what is needed. But instead of trusting him, the people will say, is the Lord among us or not? In, in fact, what the people are, are saying is, God, if you really are with us and if you really are here, you need to show us that you are with us by performing yet another miracle. And it seems that the disappointment at this point is because after all we've been through, God is saying, can't you just trust me? Or do I need to yet prove once again that I am indeed with you? And so they tested God. They demanded a sign. They showed their hardened hearts. See, Psalm 91 and Deuteronomy 6 both call for faith, but they call for two very different expressions of faith. We could say Psalm 91 is calling for an active or maybe even a risk-taking faith, but Deuteronomy 6 is calling for a passive or a reverential expression of faith. Both are a sign of faith, but different signs of faith are appropriate in different contexts. So how would we know? whether we need a reverential faith or whether we need an active, daring faith. Now, first of all, we know that it's not an either-or decision, that, that one context may call for this response and another context may call for a different response. So I think the lesson from this temptation is our situation should be guided based on God's leading and his initiative. Maybe a question we could ask ourselves is who's the pilot? Who's piloting the plane? In Psalm 91, God is piloting the plane and he's encouraging the righteous one to go actively and to do something with his divine promise of protection. But in Deuteronomy 6, what is happening is the passengers are on the plane and they're not sure the, the captain is doing his job in the cockpit, so they charge the cockpit and begin to give orders and demands to the pilot. And what Satan is trying to get Jesus to do here through this active faith is to say charge the cockpit and jesus is saying no this is a time for passive faith it is a time for me to wait on god and not to test him see whenever we practice an active faith when god calls for a passive faith the biblical name for that is testing we test god so we test god when we violate the natural order of how things should be to trust means we follow god to test means we disrupt that natural order and we try to get God to follow us. And that's exactly the order that the devil is trying to disrupt. He wants Jesus to lead and not to follow. He wants Jesus to invent a situation, which is another form of leadership, so that God will be forced to respond, which is another sort of following that he's trying to create. Satan wants Jesus to make God do his bidding but God wants Jesus to do his own bidding. So in some ways to test God is to treat God like Amazon.com. I, I once ordered something and when the box came, it wasn't what I'd ordered. And I got on the chat feature and I said that this was the wrong item. And the customer service person didn't really properly address it. So I asked, I got on the phone and I asked to talk to a manager and I essentially said, I'm not getting off the phone until you make this right and i wonder how much of our lives we spend testing god by saying i ordered something from you i, I ordered it by prayer or i ordered it by church attendance or i ordered it by good behavior and i either didn't get a package or the, what i received in the package is not what i signed up for and, and then how often do we spend our prayers functioning like complaints to the customer service department of heaven saying you've got my order wrong i need to get the right order See, at its core, testing highlights a false philosophy that can infiltrate our Christian faith. We can approach faith by what we'll call a magical philosophy instead of a discipleship philosophy. Now, now when I use the word magical, I'm not talking about Harry Potter or witches or wizards or any of that sort of thing, but I'm talking about a foundational belief that makes these assumptions. It's the desire to search for a formula that will guarantee my ideal outcome. So the magician wants to get from point A 
to point B. And they search out all the best means to, to, to get to that point, to make things happen according to their agenda. And, and if their experiment fails, then they just keep trying it until they get their desired outcome. So the key to the magician philosophy is that the individual is at the center of their world. And everything that they see is a commodity for them to use to get to the agenda that they want to get to. So the magician philosophy means seeing everything as a tool that you can use to get your desired ends. And I think we need to be honest about the fact that we all have bits and pieces and elements of us, some of it even from God, or we have that kind of a mindset or that kind of a philosophy. So I don't have the most extensive tool collection in the world, so I find sometimes when I'm doing jobs, I'm forced to look around for something to replace the thingamajigger that I'm supposed to have. And as I'm looking at everything in my house, what I'm doing is I'm looking for a tool that I can utilize. That's that magician mindset. Everything is there, a tool for you to use in whatever ends you want. And there are some parts of creation that God has made us, made for our use. But the mistake happens when we start to view the creator himself as a tool we can use to get our desired ends. So I want to illustrate with, uh, with an example that, that you might begin to see how we might begin to use this magician philosophy in our own lives. Think about a young girl who at the tender age of 10 wrote down the things that she wants in life. I want to be rich. I want to be beautiful. I want to be healthy. And I want to be important. And, and, and almost immediately that, that letter becomes one of her most precious possessions. And it's more than just a Christmas wish list of the life things that she wants. It becomes a map, a, a guide for when she's in situations. She looks at her list and says, does this help me get this or not? And she tries this and she tries that. And she tries everything. And then on one occasion, somebody tells her about a God who can do anything. A God who can fulfill your heart's desires and your deepest longings. And she thinks to herself, well, maybe this all-powerful God can be the one who can finally help me get everything on my list. So she decides to look into discipleship. But along the way, she quickly learns that this is a God who will never behave like a well-trained dog. She, she learns that she she won't be able to judge or evaluate God's goodness or effectiveness solely based on her wish list. In fact, she finally comes to a conclusion that if she really is going to follow this God, one of the things that she's going to need to be willing to give up and sacrifice is the list itself. But that's so hard for her because the list is precious to her. The list has all of her hopes and her dreams and her goals. Would she be able to give that up? See, conversion for her meant walking away from this magical philosophy in her approach to God. And she knew that were she to be baptized, that she would need to take that list and it too would die. And it too would be buried. And that God would then give her a list of how he wanted her to live. You know, you're thinking, okay, great story, but what does this have to do with Gerald Glenn? And his statement that I firmly believe that God is stronger than this dreaded virus, the same man who died from that virus. Here's a few lessons I think that we could learn. I think we should absolutely affirm that God is indeed stronger than this dreaded virus. But I think we should also remember we follow a God who is free, who is moral, and who is a person in his own sense or in his own right in terms of his personhood. He has plans that supersede mine. He has wisdom that surpasses mine. He has character that exceeds mine. And that means sometimes he's gonna work in ways that confuses me. So I cannot approach God like a spreadsheet or like a gumball machine. See, because of God's will, at least in his earthly existence, Jesus could not rest on the promises of Psalm 91. Jesus died on a cross. He was not, as the psalmist promised, protected from the snare of the fowler, or the deadly pestilence, or the terror of night, or the arrows, or the destruction, or the war. He died alone on a cross, but he did so because he knew God's will for him.
And God's will was not to, to deliver him from humanity, but his will was that through his death, he himself would deliver all humanity. So to trust in God means that we trust that he will work sometimes even in mysterious ways in us and through us. See, I think we all need to learn to say that God is bigger than this dreaded virus. We need to be able to say that when a loved one gets sick. We need to be able to say that when a loved one gets better. And we even need to learn to be able to say it when we're at the funeral of a loved one. God's ways are not our ways. Sometimes God calls us to a Psalm 91 faith. It's active and bold. And sometimes he calls us to a Deuteronomy 6 faith where we follow, even when we're following in the dark. So maybe the best way to end this sermon is to ask God to give us the grace, to give us the trust that is necessary when we walk through even the darkest valley. Maybe we need to commit to saying to our king, I believe, help my unbelief. And in all of this, I think we should commit to saying, I will not put the Lord, my God, to the test. May God bless us, empower us, and work in us. I've chosen to share some words with you today from somebody that wrote down the way I feel, much better than I could likely have expressed them myself. Um, these uh, come from the writings of a brother in Christ, Neil Pollard. Different scenarios happen in our minds that may cause us to drift mentally and spiritually as we take the Lord's Supper. This likely happens more than we care to admit. The greatest memorial of all time can also provide one of the greatest mountains to climb when it relates to concentration and avoiding distractions. The Lord's Supper is observed by His Church, but individuals participate. What does it take for individuals to maintain concentration on the significance of his feast. For starters, we do need to offer ourselves to God, all of who we are, in a way that God would find pleasing as instruments of righteousness, not based on how we define righteousness, but by God's definition of those saved by his son Jesus. Part of this is examinations, if you take a look at 1 Corinthians 11.28. We should examine our state of mind, taking care to dwell on Christ's suffering sacrifice, his triumphant resurrection, our debt to him, the depth of heaven's love shown in this sacrifice, and the joyful hope we have through his act. We should examine our lives and see where we can live better and eliminate sin. That includes checking our motives morals, and mindset. Self-examination should mark this time. Forgetting. We should forget the daily mundane affairs of life, even in the midst of a time when we are virtually together over the net, not physically together at 10th and Alderson. We are focusing on something of much greater and eternal significance. This is the Lord's time. Fellowship. We take the supper with every other saint present. In a sense, we are also taking it with all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world. The communion provides a bond of fellowship that has special meaning and ties together Christians in fellowship with Christ. One, we commemorate the Lord in the one body according to the instructions of the one spirit with the one hope that Christ's atonement saves us and gives us access to the Father. We honor that one Lord and follow that one faith in obedience to the will of the one God. This supper unites us with God as well as each other. You know, those one words, one scripture come from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. Let's pray and then share in the eating of the unleavened bread. Oh Lord God, it is always a privilege to be able to come to you in prayer to acknowledge you as the great I am, our creator and Lord. Father, we pray that uh, you are being blessed now. As across the world, there is a remembrance of your plan 
and a remembrance of your son, Jesus. Uh, Thank you for that plan, and thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to go to the cross for our sins, for that body that was put there um, as a sacrifice, Lord. Um, We're going to partake of this unleavened bread in memory of your son, Jesus, and we pray that we do this in a manner that is truly pleasing in your sight. Amen. There's also that remembrance piece. The Lord's Supper is a time to reflect on the cross with its eternal significance. Until he comes again, the Lord's Supper is a trip back to his death. Take a look at 1 Corinthians 11.26. One remembers with the help of the gospel writers, the body wounded on the tree and the saving blood flowing from the body of God in flesh. There really is to be thanksgiving. The Lord's Supper is a time for deep appreciation and deep gratitude. Because he suffered, that is Jesus, we can have peace. Because he died, that is Jesus, we can have eternal life. Because he arose, that is Jesus, we can rise from sin to newness of life. Paul had to remind the church in Corinth that the Lord's Supper was not just another meal. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Christians today, too, need to remember that this is not just another meal. We need to keep that fact in mind or else we're going to lose focus and our concentration. We don't want to forget why we are partaking of the Lord's Supper. What we need, despite the distraction, is effort. May the Lord's Supper never grow old for any of us. Let's pray and then share in the, in the drinking of the fruit of the vine. Our Lord God, we continue in prayer, knowing that uh, we are saved because of Jesus. Uh, We are saved because of his willingness to go to the cross. We are saved by his shed blood. And as we are partaking of this fruit of the vine, Father, we remember uh, everything that he has done for us, that he continues to do for us. And in that, Father, we give you thanks. And this prayer we offer in Jesus' name, amen. Another blessing of worship is our giving to the Lord. Again, as stated in Romans chapter 6 and verse 13, we need to offer every part of ourselves to him, including those financial blessings God has given to us. We've listed a couple of ways here that you can give to him, him who has given us everything. Please join me in prayer now for that offering. Father, what a blessing it is to be able to worship you wherever we are at to know that you care for us and that you have taken care of your church and therefore that means that you have taken care of every one of us individually. Uh, Father, we pray that you would bless the offering that comes before you and that uh, every congregation will really consider with with prayer, with meditation, with, uh, with deep reflection about how to best use it in honoring you and honoring your kingdom, Father. Again, we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching this service of the Billings Church of Christ. We hope it has been a blessing to you and that your week will go well. I'd like to say a prayer now for some of our members whose health has been poor and also for those who have been blessed by God. And I pray that this prayer also will bless you. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. Thank you for your creation, for its beauty, for seeing your power in it, 
and we know that you are in control of this world. Father, at this time, we ask that you be with the Vandergriffs and uh, with the uh, Gochis and also uh, with those family members who are also sick or hurting. Ask that you be with Larry Shaw and Daryl Finter as they um, continue to go through their grief for losing their spouses, but pray your comforting hand upon them. And Father, we pray that you'll be with our ladies who are pregnant and expecting and just please be with them and give them good health in this time of uncertainty. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this congregation here and we pray that you will continue to watch over it and bless it. Uh, Father, at this time we know that um, some things are changing as far as the restrictions and we pray that you will uh, give us wisdom in following those guidelines and uh, help us to continue to honor each other and to uh, respect each other's wishes. Um, we thank you so much that um, our members have been well and pray that uh, no one uh, does get infected and uh, Father just uh, please be with us uh, as we go our ways this week. We thank you for your son Jesus and we uh, know that he is in control it's in his name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.